This is just the beginning. The beginning of a new moto. A moto that consistently addresses the needs of artists. Not just game artists, visual effects artists, designers, or any other specific industry. All artists. The future of 3D is easy to use tools that enable both experts and novices. Free of performance barriers, full of workflow innovation, and driven by rapidly changing technology. Moto 17.0 has received an overhaul of many core systems, resulting in an application that is faster, more interactive, easier to develop for, and easier to test. Artists will immediately see the improvements we brought to both direct and procedural modeling tools through incremental tool updates. This allows modeling tools to update at a much faster rate, resulting in speed improvements as high as 30-fold for individual tools. These updates apply to both direct and procedural tools, making complex mesh op stacks more practical than ever before. Our goal is that throughout 2024, users will experience a moto that just keeps getting faster, more stable, more interactive, more consistent, and more refined. The work we did over the past year opens up many exciting opportunities for how we can make the moto that moto users have always dreamed of and deserve. View Objects establishes an architectural foundation that provides benefits for artists immediately and a system that will continue to evolve to unlock deeper performance improvements with each point release of Moto throughout the 17 series and beyond. Scene loading interactivity, animation playback, mesh op interaction, and rig interaction all capitalize on the improvements from view objects, resulting in higher frame rates or greater interactivity while working. However, this just scratches the surface. One of the most significant changes we made is moving many calculations to a background thread. This is part of what enables both the increased interactivity and performance improvements in 17.0, as now, for the first time ever, multiple threads are being leveraged in Moto generally. This is a milestone. We are proud of what we've accomplished and with what 17.0 offers, but this is just the beginning of what 17.0 actually enables. We've improved performance for modeling, rigging, animation, and many other aspects of Moto, but a performance initiative for a DCC app isn't complete without considering offline rendering. We are very excited to announce that we partnered with Otoy to bundle the prime version of Octane Render with 17.0. Now users of Moto will have easy access to the incredibly fast and high quality GPU rendering that Octane provides. Again, our goal is throughout 2024, users will experience a moto that just keeps getting faster, more stable, more interactive, more consistent, and more refined. The work we did over the past year opens many exciting opportunities for how we can fulfill the potential of moto that moto users have always known was there. This is just the beginning, the beginning of a new moto, and we want you to be a part of this journey. We are extremely excited to share with you what we've accomplished throughout 2023. Um, 17.0 is a milestone. This is the first time that we have dedicated an entire year and our entire engineering team just to uh, just for performance purposes, right? Just to increase the performance of Modo. And I think this is the right choice. Um, 17.0, I am very proud of. I am very proud of our engineering team and what they accomplished and the things that they did were extremely, extremely challenging. Uh, to give you a, an example of what our engineering team has been going through over the past year is they spent six months as a team working on this performance initiative called View Objects and also the tool incremental updates as well. And then after that six months was over with, they then spent six months bug fixing that major change. This is the largest architectural change that has ever been brought to Modo. And you know, to kind of relate that to the experience an artist has, it's kind of like, Somebody came over to you and dumped six months of models in your lap and said, okay, we need all of these UV, UV'd and none of them have any UVs yet. So it's very challenging work. It's not fun work. 
our engineers like making tools and features. They like seeing how you guys respond to them. And they did a great job pushing through a very challenging year and delivering what you guys see today as Moto 17.0. Now, as you see here on this slide, this is the beginning of the, the new Moto. This is just the beginning of the new Moto. And uh, we you know, will be rolling out two more point releases this year. That's our goal. That show continued performance improvements because this architectural change, the biggest thing that it's brought for us um, really is an architecture that we can continue to evolve. Um, previously, the types of changes we want to continue making that we'll talk about in this presentation would take too much effort and too much time. But this new architecture enables us well into the future to continue evolving and creating the moto that moto users deserve. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into this uh, slide deck and start talking about the fun stuff. All right, first off, I just wanna play this animation back again a few more times. This was done by Jan Gourmont. Um, I hope I'm saying your name right, Jan, uh, probably not. Um, but I just love this little animation. Jan is a modeler. Jan's one of the best modelers I've ever met. Um, he's not an animator. He doesn't do a lot of shading work, things of that sort. He's a modeler. But he put together this animation for us. And uh, we you know, kind of collaborated with a bunch of the people on the Alpha and Heroes team. Frederick Widman did a lot of the, uh, the, the plants using tropism, which is freaking awesome. You can just see how good all those assets look. Um, but Jan decided he wanted to kind of, you know, do something more and tackle an animation project. And I, I think this is just freaking wonderful. And we kind of came up with a theme of, all right, we're moving past 16.1 and up ahead on the next three exits is 17.0, 17.1, and 17.2. And we're already hard at work on the next animation for 17.1. If anybody wants to participate in some of the asset creation, um, the asset creation for 17.0 was a really great experience in that I think we have the best content we've had in, I'll say, a very long time. I don't want to say the best content ever, but definitely the best content in a very, very long time. And that's because of all the great content that um, our alpha testers provided to us and our heroes provided to us. So thank you to all of those people involved in the project. And also thank you again to Jan, who did so many great things that we're using in this release. So the agenda for today, what have we done for 17.0 and why? Then we'll move on to some tool performance demos, view objects demos, feature enhancements, native Mac OS ARM, prime version of Octane Render, what isn't working and why, which look, this is you know what we gotta talk about. Um, I need to make sure you guys know what to expect in 17.0. And, uh, and then of course, what's next? And that is what you guys can uh, you know, expect to see us working on for 17.1 and 17.2. And then finally, thank yous. There's a lot of people to thank um, for this release. All right, Moto 17.0, what have we done and why? And so this is the, uh, the copy that we wrote uh, to describe 17.0. And so I'm just going to kind of stick to it and kind of mend it a little bit. But in 17.0, you will experience new levels of performance and unlock your creative potential. With an overhauled architecture and powerful tool performance enhancements, Moto just got even better. So 3D is no longer a niche technology with highly specific workflows that are unique to an industry. I'm going to stop right here. This is central to our plan moving forward. Um, there were many years where, depending upon which industry you worked in, workflows were completely different, you know, per industry. Now, that's just not the case anymore. I, 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 I see visual effects artists, designers, and game artists all using the same workflows. Um, and that's been going on for a very long time. We've been moving towards that for a very long time. And so I'm not as interested in focusing on a particular industry or a particular market as I am in just creating a great 3D asset creation tool that enables both experts and novices. And we have a lot of fun plans for how we want to realize that um, as we move past the 17 series and even during to some degree. So all 3D artists need the same thing today. Performance, powerful tools, and streamlined workflows. Moto 17.0 sets the stage to address the needs of artists today while also enabling future innovations. The new release brings deep architectural changes that deliver performance increases across direct modeling tools, mesh shops, animation playback, and rig interaction. 
Even rendering is faster in 17.0 thanks to the prime version of Octane Render from Otoy, which we are so excited about um, and even more excited about working with Otoy on improving uh, um, Octane in Modo. It's been a pleasure um, you know, getting this rolling. So now you can have the fastest modeler and fastest renderer all in one package. Moto 17.0, the tool performance demo. So let's get on to actually showing you what you can expect while working in 17.0 and uh, the 17 series. So first off, incremental tool updates. Uh, this is a kind of an isolated initiative where we were improving the performance of individual tools. This applies to both direct modeling tools and their procedural equivalents, all right? Now, the way that Moto's modeling tools work, or especially direct modeling tools work, is we have a tool pipe, right? So the tools that you use are actually a combination of all these different tool components. So when we actually increase the performance on 10 of Moto's modeling tools, it actually affects many more than just 10 individual tools because of the modular nature of our you know, modeling tool pipe. And that, of course, is also the case with procedural modeling when you have a stack of multiple models operations. This has uh, kind of compounding benefits when you have multiple mesh shops that have been accelerated, of course. And now let's take a look at some demos from Steve Hill, some very basic geometric uh, demos or demos with very simple geometry just to kind of show you the, you know, more raw performance improvements. So first off, edge relax, you can see on the left-hand side, 41 to 100, not a huge difference. Um, but right here, 5 to 45, and then moving on over to some clone stuff, which is a huge difference from 1 to 55, 1 to 66. Then uh, a little bit of a loop slice and uh, sliding that around. You can see what a big difference that uh, produced on that mesh. Um, now, your mileage will vary. Depends upon the model that you're working on, how dense it is already, how many other things are in the scene. But you can see what the raw performance enhancements for each of these tools brings as far as performance increases are concerned. And there is more room for more improvements as we continue moving through the 17 series and beyond. So great set of uh, basic demos from Steve showing off a lot of the individual improvements. And now let's uh, take a look at this example from Chemo. Um, I believe this is actually, it might be Curve Extrude, I'm not 100% certain, but playing it back as an animation. And you'll notice here that on the left-hand side, I have 17.0 on the right, 16. Um, and as I play these back at the same time with sync playback drawing off, but play real time turned on, it's about four times faster um, in 17.0. And so a more practical example of work that somebody was doing um, uh, you know, for, you know, for their job and showing that, that increase in performance. And of course, a couple things are going on here. So definitely happy seeing uh, this example. Now, what happens when you turn off play real time though? It goes completely crazy. Um, you can see the FPS jumps up to 300 FPS. I don't think this is actually uh, representative of what you can expect, but it does show that there's a lot more going on behind the scenes. And I wanna, I wanna make sure that we really inform you guys on um, you know, where you will see the performance improvements and how to enable seeing and experiencing those performance improvements. And sync playback drawing uh, is a major component of that. All right, now let's go ahead and take a look at uh, a more practical edge relax example on a fairly dense mesh here. And uh, you can see on the left-hand side, we have 16.1 now. And that's you know running up four, five frames per second, six, it got all the way up to six. And now over here in 17.0, if we go ahead and use the same tool, now we're gonna go ahead and jump up to between 30 to 40 frames per second. So big, big, big improvement in speed on a practical asset. And next up, uh, taking a look just at um, Polygon Slice. Um, love this asset from Polypol. It's just beautiful. And there's no FPS meter on this, but wanted to show it to you guys anyway, because it's very interactive, right? And it's a beautiful model with great shading on it. And you can see how well the asset is performing and how, uh, how good the interaction is despite the complex shading. And so nice example from Polypol. Next up, view objects demos. Um, there are plenty more things we could show you about incremental tool updates. I've got a 70 slide slide deck here to move through. Um, so um, we'll be showing you more in some of the quick clips, which should be coming out very shortly. Um, so let's go on to the system wide change, which is view objects. 
This is the architectural change. So this is the largest architectural change Moto has ever seen. We've created a system that allows us to accelerate how quickly things are drawn in the viewport and added the ability to also push calculations to a background thread. This means that Moto can leverage two threads at once in 17.0, while future editions should allow for more background threads. Um, this marks the beginning of Moto taking greater advantage of modern many-threaded systems. And so um, view objects is actually a combination of many things. So it brings things to the viewport in a much more efficient way. Um, that was one of the bottlenecks as far as performance is concerned uh, for users in, in Moto in the past. And just having a background thread enables a lot more interactivity. We didn't enable more background threads because of course we need to make sure we get the base implementation right. And that's what you're gonna experience in 17.0 and you will see continued improvements as we move into point one and point two. And so now let's go ahead and take a look at some of these view objects, view object demos. And this is just a loading demo right here. You can see that the incremental loading that you'll experience with view objects each individual item is loaded, you know, um, just as it's available. And you'll notice this with lots of different aspects of scene loading and even major changes to the viewport while you're working, right? If you do something really, really, really major. And you can still interact, you can still select things. Um, this is something that we wanna take much further. You can, of course, uh, um, make it so that it doesn't come in really, really well if you have a crazy big, you know, asset that you're working on. But you know, this is what you'll be seeing more of uh, throughout the 17 series. And let's take a look at this Cobra asset. Now, this is just a simple mesh transform of the entire body of this Cobra model from Jan. And uh, on the left, we have 16.1. On the right, we have 17.0. And you can see on, on the left, we're getting six frames per second. Um, really not, not great performance at all, and it feels like pushing through mud. You feel each of the pauses and the hitches um, that happen while you're interacting. Now in 17.0, you can see the FPS is way higher. The mesh does lag behind the, uh, the transform locator or whatever, the transform tool, okay? Now, this is one of those things that we're like, ah, oh, the feeling of it is so much better, and we, it's hard to communicate that through video. And uh, we were at first worried like, oh, that you know, having it lag behind, would that be disorienting or discouraging? And it's not, um, you know, this is something we validated extensively with our alpha testers. It provides a much, much, much more comfortable experience, and this is something that we also can continue to further improve. All right, so let's go on to this mosquito demo, which is another asset from Jan. And uh, right here on the left, we have 16.1 and moving the end of a joint chain with IK and it's getting like 40 frames per second, right? Now, if we come on over to 17.0 and start moving that same, same element around, it jumps up to 60 frames per second. So only really a 50% improvement, but that's because we're editing the end of a joint chain and uh, you know multiple joints because it's IK. Um, however, what we really wanna kind of show off is like grabbing the root of a joint chain. So on the left, 16.1, you know, we're getting up to five or six frames per second, all right? And it does not feel comfortable when you're interacting. Now over in 17.0, you have a very different experience. So now let's go ahead and grab this mesh and start moving it around. And you can see we went from five or six to 40 frames per second. So a big difference in really manipulating a practical asset. And we did show this in the overview video, this asset, um, but this, the shading in here is simplified. It's, a, it's still the advanced viewport, but it's not a, the shading isn't as complex. And you can see even greater performance uh, differences in that case. And another example uh, with the mosquito, just using channel haul to haul the opening and closing of the wings. And you know, on the left, it got as high as nine or 10. On the right, it's going up into the 50s. And so, you know, again, another nice big you know, performance enhancement in using some of the cool tools in Moto like channel haul. And next up, uh, the shark scene from Greg Lewinberger. Greg was really great about providing us a, a lot of scenes for us to test view objects on. And um, this is an example showing, you know, of course, three sharks that um, the animation is being played back on between 16.1 and, and, and 17.0. You can see that the difference in FPS is not tremendous. It's only six versus seven. And the reason for that really is sync playback drawing, which you see over here. You see the bones and the meshes are synced up with one another. Um, now that's what sync playback drawing does now in 17.0. If I turn off play real time, 
uh, in 16.1 and 17.0, you'll also see it really doesn't change anything. It's just that the animation plays back much slower because it's playing every single frame, but there isn't an increased difference between 16.1 and 17.0. However, it starts getting much more interesting when you turn off sync playback drawing and when you turn off locators because the locators and the mesh are being drawn separately. Previously, they were waiting for one another to be done before drawing a frame, right? And so when we actually turn off sync playback drawing, um, you see a tremendous increase, but you also see a disconnect between the bones versus the meshes or a slight disconnect between multiple meshes being updated at the same time, right? And so let's go ahead and stop playing 17.0, come over here, turn off sync, sync playback drawing. You can see how fast it's playing. It's too fast. And it's also disorient, disorienting having the bones playing back disconnected from the actual mesh itself. However, here I'm going to turn off show locators in 16.1 and start playing this back and you'll notice that it's not any faster when I turn off show locators in 16.1, but when I turn off show locators in 17.0, it gets even faster, right? And this is one of those things where it's like, man, we should probably just turn bones or locators off during animation playback. And you see the real practical difference when you turn play real time on, but sync playback drawing is off. You get this very nice, very smooth animation playback that when compared with 16.1 is you know, like 11 times faster. And so these are the things that you guys need to be aware of. These are things that we're gonna to continue to refine throughout the 17 series. But I think it really speaks to the power of the enhancements that we have added during the 17 series. And now we have uh, another incremental loading example. And um, this is a slightly different example in that there's a couple very basic meshes and then there is a scanned mesh that is very dense. And 17.0 oh, on the left in this case is loading much faster. You saw it loading incrementally, but it still has more meshes to load up on the right. 16.1 uh, isn't even done yet. And you can see the, uh, the user actually moving around the viewport while they are waiting for the assets to actually pop in. And so in a few moments, you'll see the scanned asset pop, pop in even before 16.1 um, is done loading the scene as a whole, you know, with textures and all sorts of great stuff. So I thought that was a, an interesting practical example. And uh, here's an asset from Yoshika Yuji who um, did this entire, um, you know, this asset with Polyhall actually, and almost using that tool, you know, exclusively. We'll be talking about that in the feature enhancements later. Um, but he saw some performance enhancements with MDDs. And so if we come on over here and we take a look at um, his experience with scrubbing around or playing um, back the timeline in 16.1, you can see that, I mean, it's like, one frame per second or something like that. Like you barely can see the actors updating, the um, the animated characters updating. And now he's scrubbing and he's just not getting a lot of feedback, a lot of skipping, a lot of waiting. You actually feel as you're dragging that as though you're being restrained. And here on the on the right in 17.0, you can see that he's scrubbing through the timeline in an unimpeded way. The meshes are not you know drawing every single frame, but you can see what's going on in your scene much, much, much better. And an animation playback would also run much better than you see in 16.1. And you'll see more examples of that and some of our updating, uh, our, our upcoming examples. And so here's another animation playback example using the Cobra scene from Jan. And he's scrubbing through the scene to kind of see how the animation is looking, right? You know, just evaluating. And the experience is very slow. It's very choppy. It's about three frames per second, right? Very hard to assess your animation in this case. And if we go on over to 17.0 and we start doing exactly the same thing, the experience is completely different. And so from three FPS over to around 13 FPS, there we go, it kind of peaked up around 13, 14. And you can see that Jan's able to really understand the animation work that he's been doing because the performance is there to provide the updates that you know he can really assess. And next up, this uh, tank model. Now, one of the, like you do see this improvement in a lot of different areas and it wasn't an intentional improvement. So this is just navigating around the viewport. You can see in 16.1 uh, on this asset getting 40 some odd frames per second and in 17.0 going up to 100. And so view objects wasn't supposed to improve interaction navigation around a scene, static assets, right? Um, it's about moving geometry like polygons in component mode, but there's still, and I've seen this in many of the scenes I've worked in, 
a performance improvement um, that comes just from navigating around your scene in many cases. But that is that is something we were hoping to actually focus on for um, uh, performance improvements later on. And it's already manifested with the work that we've done and something, again, that we can just keep on improving from here. Now, this is a, an interesting example from Chemo. Playing back this animation of the Moto logo on the on the left is 16.1, on the right is 17.0. And uh, you can see that you know, 17.0 is only probably 50% faster in this case, but I thought this was a, an interesting example because he plays them back uh, simultaneously. And then you start to see about 100% improvement. So it's interesting how this speaks to the threaded nature of 17.0. And, uh, you know, it, like it's just much more robust. Things don't interrupt it as much. So you're going to have more reliable of a performance experience by being able to push um, these things to background threads. And now we have uh, this character from Volker Choi moving the entire character, running at five, six frames per second. And this is not a very comfortable experience. Posing the uh, leg and foot, moving around the shoulder, coming in, you know, around four FPS, and then, you know, posing the arm uh, with an IK chain, right? And, uh, and, you know, getting around five or six FPS. And then we hop on over to 17.0, and what you're going to see is you know, a much higher FPS, but it feels much higher than that. You also see the meshes disconnecting from each other. And that's because things are being, you know, updated in an unsynced way, which opens up a lot of performance. But you can see that the posing experience is way better. Like it's much easier to understand, you know, the shapes that you're creating with your poses and being able to modify those. And this is another example where the feeling is much higher than the FPS difference. Um, so play around with 17.0. Um, we'll be getting more assets like this out to you guys to tinker with. And so you can actually experience the, the difference in feel because the, the difference in feel is the most dramatic aspect. Um, and that, that's the feedback we've received from our alpha testers. All right, next up, Mac OS ARM. This is another very important aspect of this release. This is the first native version of Moto on Mac ARM, right? And so on M1, M2, M3 processors. And uh, it resulted in an average of 50% speed improvements when compared to emulating the x86 or Intel version of Moto for Macs, right? And you still get the advantage of the performance enhancements that we did for the 17 series as well. And so this should make for a much better experience for, for those of you who have the new Mac systems. And you can still use the, uh, the old emulated version on those systems as well. We provide that to you for the things that aren't working great, right? And so there are some items that are unavailable in 17.0 due to third-party technology not being compatible with Mac ARM. The Ikenema full body IK um, uh, technology that, you know, unfortunately there is no library for that on Mac ARM. And so there's nothing we can do about it. We need to find an alternate solution for full body IK, um, one that works on all platforms. Feel free to let the folks who own um, iKinema know that you sure do want um, a, uh, a, a Mac ARM library for iKinema. Um, we'd love to just continue using it, but currently our plan is to go another direction um, because unfortunately there's that it's just not available. So, so um, they will work with the x86 emulated version of 17.0, which is important. And this has also affected the pose tool and retargeting, um, um, which are, you know, are reliant on iKinema. Now let's start taking a look at some of the demos for Mac Arm. We have the three shark scene from Greg Lewenberger. You can see on the left, 16.1, on the right, 17.0. And we're getting about 23 FPS playing back all three sharks. And on the right in 17.0, it goes up to 32, 33. Now, this becomes more dramatic when we open up the settings panel and we turn off sync playback drawing. You can see how the FPS jumps very dramatically. Um, and so again, sync playback drawing is something for you guys to know about um, because it, it, it has a very strong impact and we're thinking about how we can leverage this in more intelligent ways. And if we come on over to take a look at just some tool performance demos on Mac Arm, uh, Loop Slice, 
uh, again, 16 one on the left, and let's go ahead and perform a slice through this mesh item. This uh, it's kind of a coilover, a shock absorber, but coilover. And yeah, dragging and hauling the location of that loop slice kind of peaks around five or six frames per second. And then we do the same thing in 17.0, and the difference is pretty darn dramatic, right? It's 30 frames per second, you know, 25 to 30 frames per second, but on a subdivision surface asset and also with a lot of shading present. And so some nice improvements there. And now let's take a look at Curve Extrude, just hauling it with Channel Haul. And so the, the Channel Haul is just hauling a channel that is usually in the UI. By the way, um, it's always faster if you use Channel Haul over using uh, hauling channels in the regular UI. You can just select a channel, hit the C key, and it will pop up this Channel Haul that you see right here. But such a dramatic improvement here. Rockets up to 85, 90, 100 frames per second. Um, quite a big difference in this example. Next up, feature enhancements. So, you know, we didn't plan on really working on any features or adding many enhancements, but at the same time, occasionally there's downtime. Our engineers pick up things and improve them. And so a lot of nice enhancements to many of our tools I'd like to go over with you guys. So you get quicker feedback from mesh ops just because of view objects and the incremental tool updates. And so you really see this combined improvement um, with the mesh ops system, and it's a, a great example. Um, now you can see here in this image that um, I'm showing an edge selection, and that's one of the aspects that has been improved that we will talk about. And so let's go ahead and take a look at this teacup demo, and we're gonna have a polygon selection. You can see on the right, 17.0 much cleaner and easier to see, but the real difference is with edge selections, you can see 17.0, much easier to see the edge selections than it was in 16.1. And this is part of uh, you know a series of updates that were, were done by Ben um, that improve mesh op workflow in many, many, many ways. We'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, another uh, feature enhancement is polyhaul. A bunch of capabilities were added to polyhaul. This image is from Yoshika Yuji, and uh, this is the asset that he modeled almost exclusively with polyhaul. And so let's take a look at how Yoshika is using this. A um, couple changes here. We've added, you know, just icons and buttons uh, for the different modes because polyhaul is a whole bunch of modeling tools rolled into one. And it helps a lot when you have icons that are showing what a specific thing would or would not do, right? And he's just using some of the capabilities for selection with fall offs that's new and the ability to say, well, uh, you know, uh, do I want to, to, you know, extrude or offset um, all the polys as connected or as individual polys despite that they're all selected. And so it allows him to quick, quickly create this stair, these stairs. And I just love how Polyhall is kind of magical about how it deals with geometry that would cause problems oftentimes. You saw how it welded everything and produced a nice contiguous mesh. And now he's just continuing to use these um, fall off capabilities to produce that shape. And a lot of this stuff that's happening with Polyhall, what you saw there were Booleans and it's what you'll see right here. So many of the things that you experience while using Polyhall are actually Booleans behind the scenes. And that's something we're interested in leveraging more, right? So you can have more workflows with less effort um, in kind of cleaning up your geometry, right? And so there we go. Nice example from Yoshikai. And next up, uh, quickly booleaning patterns with Primitive Slice. Primitive Slice is a Boolean tool that uses curves for slicing or Booleans. And uh, you can see that here, William Vaughn is drawing out a rectangle shape and it's immediately slicing through the geometry that he attached it to. And you can now clone it. And uh, so definitely a very useful enhancement being able to clone um, you know, pretty much any shape uh, with, with Primitive Slice because you can have custom curves performing the slices as, uh, as curve presets. And you can also round the corners of things like the, um, the rectangle type. Um, so nice enhancements to Primitive Slice. And I love this tool. We can definitely take this one further as well. And another just quick example from William using the clone capabilities and the rounded corners, you know, producing excellent shapes that would be very, very frustrating to produce otherwise. All right. So mesh cleanup, uh, we added one enhancement to mesh cleanup. I love this asset from Polypol. You guys will be seeing more of that in upcoming releases as well because we're kind of expanding on it. 
And uh, let's go ahead and take a look at mesh cleanup. This is a, a situation that people run into all the time. Mesh cleanup cleans up your geometry, right? In all sorts of different ways. And this is the new capability where if you have vertices that are not welded to an adjacent polygon, mesh cleanup can handle that for you. And so let's go ahead and just run mesh cleanup here. And uh, there we go, it's taken care of. And now William will go and select the vertices that previously were detached. And you can see they're attached. So just making sure you guys have less effort uh, in your day-to-day -day modeling tasks. These are the types of things that really matter. Um, partial radial alignment, very cool um, addition to radial align. So the first one, let's just make a perfect circle. Second one, let's go ahead and make a pentagon and then a hexagon. And the third one, let's just select part of it and make an arc. And so now we have an archway uh, produced very quickly, very easily, very evenly distributed. Um, great enhancement to radial line from Taz, the amazing Taz. And uh, I'm gonna let you guys listen to William Vaughn in this video on, um, on Polyhall and the um, automatic unioning of, um, of, of meshes that cross over each other or geometry that crosses over each other. The Polyhall tool is a collection of commonly used modeling tools that enable you to seamlessly switch between a variety of modeling operations in a single tool. A new function has been added to this powerful tool that automatically unions intersecting geometry that is created while hauling. Save time with this new functionality and reduce the need to manually clean up geometry when creating assets in Modo. Nobody says it better or faster than William Vaughn does. And I just love the example of showing that turning into a sub D at the end and what the results are. Again, lots of really clever things being done with Booleans behind the scenes there by Taz. And next up, we improved many aspects of the advanced viewport. And so uh, one to point out that there isn't a demo of, we removed the um, ambient occlusion option for the viewport. And so there, uh, one option, which was the legacy version, we only have the hybrid mode available now because it's, it's the good one, right? You guys don't need the one that really isn't as good as hybrid. We left it in there for a couple of years. We wanna take it out. We wanna take a lot of things out of Moto um, in its near future. Um, don't worry, it's not, uh, we're, we're very cautious about what that is and we will talk with you about these things. And so um, we added a use texture checkbox, better wireframe display and new lighting options so that the advanced viewport can be um, better suited for modeling. So first off, this is just showing off a nice asset from Polypol. Um, this is the default viewport currently. And if he switches on over to the advanced viewport, you can see the switch happens pretty darn fast considering all the textures, um, but much, much better shading, very comfortable um, for modeling, but modeling in context. And we need more of this. We've needed more of this and uh, really happy with um, the assets that Paul is creating, Polly Paul is creating. Um, love to have more people participate with us in this project. And Volker Troy here with this asset is showing using scene lighting and then switching it to default plus environment, right? And so what this does is it uses the viewport lights, which move with the viewport, right, for direct lighting. And then it uses the environment to, you know, fill in the additional kind of nice shading that the advanced viewport is capable of. And so much better lighting for modeling purposes. And also uh, you can already see the much better wireframe display um, illustrated there. But let's go into a little bit more detail on wireframe display. Um, Volker isn't really using a wide or uh, uh, um, isn't using a strong width, a wide width, okay, um, for the edge width option we added in 16.1. Um, and it becomes more obvious there, but you saw how the mesh got dark in 16.1 as you moved farther away. It happens far less often in 17.0, like it, it just has much better integrity. And uh, as another example to, to show you, um, we'll show the wireframe in 16.1 on the left. And there you go, you see how lots of edges push close together. You get this very non-uniform shading to the wireframe, or it, it looks like certain wireframes are thicker than others, bolder than others, and it's just, it's just ugly. And there's also points in between each actual vertex showing kind of the sub-D resolution. That's annoying. And here on the right is 17.0 with nice consistent wireframe display zooming in and out, it maintains its integrity much better. And you know, we may need to actually raise the opacity on this. Um, it's a 10% currently, and um, it's a little soft for my liking. I'd like to hear from you guys on that, but much, much cleaner wireframe frame display, and I was using an edge width of two um, in the viewport preferences. 
And just another um, viewport example from uh, Polypol. It's beautiful, right? It's one of those that, especially with depth of field, you know, for a moment I confused for a render. And Paul is just playing around with that, which is super cool. It was done in plasticity. The model was done in plasticity. You know, I think Moto is a great pair for plasticity. Love to love to see more plasticity users bring in their models into Moto. And we'd like to help facilitate that. Um, all right, next up is the use texture checkbox. And you can see that this scene, which is pretty dense, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of geometry in here, like 24 million polys is what I see um, in the lower right hand corner. It might be hard for you guys to see that. Um, it is also being shown on a 4K monitor, which makes it a little bit harder. But turning on or turning off use texture hides all the textures in the shader tree, but keeps the materials. Now, here's an example of what has been there previously, which is turning off use shader tree. And that turns everything white. Uh, it's always driven me nuts because it's an advantage not having to have textures drawn all the time. You don't have to wait for the textures to recompile. And so I find that I just want to be able to turn off the textures, but see the actual material settings uh, in my scene quickly and easily so it doesn't have to recompile everything over and over and over again. So just a nice, you know, uh, enhancement for ease of use and comfort. All right. Now we are on to the prime version of Octane Render. Um, super excited to have Octane Render from Otoy and Modo. Uh, it is a fantastic renderer. Uh, the experience of working on that Cobra animation, it was great watching Jan work on this and use Octane. If you notice, almost all the renders that we show you guys in this presentation and for the content is all done in Octane. So they already had a great implementation in Modo. Um, we will be working with Otoy. Uh, this year on, on improving aspects of the um, implementation that is bundled with Modo to make it more robust and uh, more neatly integrated, right? And there's a lot, a lot of capabilities we can, we can add. So let's take a look at some of the examples here. And here's Jan working on that Cobra scene and just scrubbing through uh, the animation. And it's just amazing how quickly Octane updates right there, right? And so Jan's able to really get an idea of what's going on and make tweaks and tunes to get exactly the results he wants, and he doesn't have to wait. And even with depth of field, and I just love this example uh, because this is the experience we had watching him work on it, and it was that in itself was a gratifying experience. All right, and now just this is an example of some of the changes we will be making to the UI regarding Octane. So here on the left-hand side, you can see that we have our tool menu on the top and there's an Octane icon right there. And so if we come on over and select that menu, now the Octane uh, um, tools essentially are all available in that one menu. And you can open up Octane Render through any of the pop-out panels in the UI as well. Something interesting to point out here, you see how the, the render is faceted, there's no smoothing. Well, if we have a geo window open and we you know run the render, that smoothing is now present. You need a GL window to be open um, for the smoothing to work. That's something that we can improve in the future, but something I think is also important to point out to you guys. And now let's go on over to a, uh, a fairly basic example, example, a sphere. I'm definitely trying to avoid showing you guys spheres and cubes, um, but I think this is a very practical example of comparing Moto's legacy preview renderer with Octane. And you can see that um, there's a bunch of materials on this sphere, sphere, there's depth of field, and it, you know, we're starting to be able to see the material refine, but it takes a long time. And it's just not a very satisfying experience, is it? And people want to see the result of their material instantly so that they can keep on working. And uh, if we switch on over to Octane, go ahead and let it run, bam, it just pops into place immediately. Turning off one material and letting it you know, load the previous ones, it shows up instantly. And so, so much better of a working experience um, when it's just something as simple as taking a look at your materials, right? And what isn't working, what's changing, and why? All right, so this is very important. Uh, we'll move on over to features removed. Um, we've taken out various things. We, there are other things that we will be taking out in the future. Now, we want your feedback on this because it benefits the development of Moto dramatically if we have less code, things that aren't being used. 
the rock item is an example of one of those things. I don't think a lot of people use that one. Um, and there are so much better assemblies out there for things like the rock item. Uh, Alexander Shmakov already has an assembly up on his Gumroad page that is fantastic. The hair material, it was great when it originally came out. It really only works in the legacy renderer. Um, and it, it's just, it's hard to use and it's very slow. You can get better results with the physically based or principled materials. Um, and you know, if we wanna have a dedicated hair material, we'll look at that in the future, but there is of course one for Octane already. And uh, WebView, that's the splash screen that you have seen for years in Moto. It has caused a lot of problems. And so we pulled that out. We wanna have a different solution in the future. Python 2, we are sticking to Python 3 now. If anybody needs any help uh, updating plugins or advice or guidance, we are more than happy to provide that. We want everybody to be on Python 3, but this is important for security and many other things. Um, 3D connection devices, space mouse, and things of that sort. There was a major driver change, and so currently it's not supported on any platform. Let us know how much this matters to you, right? Because if it's super critical, and we hear that from you know enough people, we'll add it back in. Uh, but we need to hear your feedback on that. And uh, it's just unfortunate that there was such a major change to the drivers and like support for the older items. And uh, yeah, um, we'd, like to, we'd like to give you what you guys need. Now, the tic-tac-toe command, oh my goodness. Um, yeah, Mike and I, Mike Jensen and I weren't even aware this existed, <laughs> but apparently you used to be able to play tic-tac-toe in Moto. Um, well, you can't anymore, but if you, if you really wanna give that a try, you can, uh, you can load up uh, 16.1. Yeah, I don't know what the command is offhand. It was definitely a surprise. Mac OS ARM limitations. Full body IK and features that use it are not available on Apple Silicon ARM builds. Still available, of course, on the um, emulated OS 10 builds. And the reason is there is no library for um, Apple Silicon, right? Um, it's just unfortunate. We will be finding a different solution for it. AXF material not available on Apple Silicon. Again, still can use it on the OS 10 emulated version. Um, I'd like to know how important you guys think AXF actually is. Uh, my opinion is we really don't need a whole lot of custom material types. We need one or maybe two at most that work really well. And we need to export anything relating to shading, textures, stuff like that to be properly configured for the place that they're gonna go. Is it going to Unreal Engine? You know, is it is it going over to uh, Unity instead? Um, you know, any it, you can configure um, the maps to be suited for where they're going. And I just don't see a whole lot of value in a lot of the custom materials. Again, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Um, plugins that don't have ARM versions, Power Sub D NURBS and Power Translators don't have an ARM version. The NPR kit um, doesn't as well. Now, Power Sub D NURBS, Power Translators, that is out of our control. Still have access to it on the OS X Intel build. Um, but the NPR kit, that's on us, that's our kit. And so we will be updating it because the NPR kit is pretty freaking awesome still. And um, Octane Render Prime limitations. And so it requires NVIDIA graphics, Kepler series or higher, not supported on AMD or Intel GPUs. Um, a dialog will pop up if CUDA needs to be downloaded. If you already have or ha are going to buy the Studio Plus version, which I highly recommend because it comes with a lot of awesome additional things um, and it's installed externally, it'll conflict with the built-in Prime version. Use system kit toggle enable to disable one or the other for whichever one you need. Um, a more elegant solution will be offered in future releases. Mac OS Octane Render Prime, which is bundled with Moto, is not included in the Intel build since it requires Apple Silicon hardware on Mac OS. And on Mac OS, if the Studio Plus version of the plugin is installed externally, Mac OS ARM build will currently crash. We are going to improve this, of course, but the solution is to uninstall, delete the external plugin, and we already have a support article up in place uh, to help you guys with any issues that you are running into. All right, now for procedural modeling workflow enhancements. I just wanted to toss this in here um, because Ben did a great job improving procedural modeling workflow. Um, so an example of this is you, you click in the mesh shop panel, you hit the M key and it operates just the way it does in direct modeling. It previously, you had to actually create a node or create a mesh shop, go into that mesh shop and assign, um, uh, the correct material name. And it was just very, it was a big hassle. Um, now you just hop into that, that panel, hit the M key and you can add a material procedurally in exactly the same way that you do for direct modeling. There's a lot of changes in here. Quick calling for mesh ops, tool handles display um, immediately. Uh, yeah, take a look at this slide and uh, go through the, the changes. 
you're definitely going to enjoy uh, the movement on these changes. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of plans for improving um, MeshOp workflow in the future. And along with that, the ability to uh, um, more reliably duplicate procedural stacks without having all sorts of errant connections. Again, you can pause here if you want to go through all of the individual improvements, but there's quite a few. Ben just did an amazing job getting that stuff in for us. So what is next, right? And uh, this is the part you guys can be excited about once we get past this slide, which is the disclaimer. These are features that we will be pursuing, emphasis on pursuing, during the Moto 17.1 and 17.2 release cycle. However, this is not a commitment to all of these features making it into the final release. We do not anticipate being able to complete every feature listed here. As features are developed during a release cycle, we often start with a wide slate of features that we were working on. As the cycle progresses, we often focus more effort on one feature versus another, based on which will bring the greatest benefit to users or is capable of successful completion in a given time frame. This is particularly true in the case of performance enhancements. So, in the interest of transparency, we are sharing our broad goals with the users of Moto. Feedback from users does impact our priorities. Please feel free to let us know which features stand out from this presentation. Your opinions matter to us. Now, this is the important bit. I consider completing 60% of the following features as successful. If we hit 70%, that means we kick some serious butt. 80% means we have exceeded our expectations. Um, if we hit 100%, I'm not doing my job because I'm not aspiring to great enough of heights, all right? And so um, I always need to have a slate of features that we can kind of move around on to make sure we get a release out to you that really has a, a strong impact on your day-to-day. -day. So 171 feature list. These are the things we are planning on working on, right? P5 is the highest priority. That's how we, how we prioritize things behind the scenes here. And so first off, a lot more performance work. That is what the 17 series is all about again. Next thing we'll be tap tackling, the many item issue with few objects. So, you know, Moto is, slows down when you have lots and lots and lots, like thousands or tens of thousands of items. Um, now we can improve that and view objects is suited to do so. We also are improving transform mesh edits, like moving around the Cobra um, geometry, right? Like you saw. Um, there's a lot of ways we can improve basic mesh transforms. Uh, so we will be tackling that again. And weight painting. So this will be the first phase of weight painting improvements. There will be multiple phases to this. Um, pretty challenging. There are a lot of different systems that contribute to weight painting. And so we want to give you a meaningful enhancement first and keep on improving that over the next two or three releases, right? And bounding box on load, just not very important actually, uh, but a bounding box would appear before any other geometry appears. And so kind of incrementally loading, or this is an addition to the incremental loading stuff. I, I would say that's even P1 right now. UI refresh. We want to have a high DPI moto. Um, the UI refresh is the first step towards that. Um, UI refresh will not be high DPI, but it will kind of change some of the colors and the way things are presented to users. It'll pull a lot of UI, uh, UI elements out and just make a much more refined experience, you know, like completely changing presets, stuff like that. Uh, so first UI refresh, including UI cleanup, um, that is our highest priority to enable us to move on to um, working on a high DPI version towards the end of this year. And that won't come out at the end of this year, but we'll be you know, starting to really hit hard on it at that point. We've actually already started on it, but that's when we'll be, you know, have everything together and start hammering away. OmniPy is a new pie menu system, and it's actually the first thing we're kind of experimenting with for high DPI. So um, it might be higher DPI when you see it in the UI. Um, but anyway, it's a much better pie menu system that will, should provide access to all the tools through one single pie menu, one single entry point, and uh, all sorts of great additional things like context sensitivity and stuff like that. But that will be later phases. So the first phase is just the most basic new pie menu system, and we'll just keep on adding more valuable capabilities to it over time. So tools, more tool performance optimization. All right, I mean, we can just keep on doing this and we will now the tools that we want to improve, for instance, slide, push, stuff like that. 
a lot, a lot more tools that we can, you know, produce the same performance differences that you saw, you know, uh, or see with 17.0. And tool consolidation, I really feel like we need to merge more of our tools together in the UI, especially, and even as far as just the functionality of tools in general. Um, but an example of this is uh, like the slide tool, right? The slide tool, if you use it, you know, through the button in the UI, um, you know, it's actually in multiple different locations uh, and you have to, you know, uh, actually choose which mode you're in, which is really kind of depend, should be dependent just on what type of component is selected, a vertex or an edge, right? Um, a vertex edge or face, because uh, slide tool can work on faces too. And so we want it to be more context sensitive. If you use the keybind version of the slide tool, it is, it's, it is context sensitive. If you have a vertex selected, it selects the right element. If you have an edge selected, it selects the right element, you know, or the right mode for, for a slide. Um, we want that to happen everywhere. The, the discontinuity is unacceptable. So stability and bug fixes, continued frequent V releases every two to four weeks. And this is something that is always going to be a high priority because we are very committed to consistently improving our stability moving forward. View objects really enables that in ways that weren't possible before. 17.2, all right. So first off for performance, dynamic view objects, types, and you can see that there are a variety of options in here. Um, since we will have moved past the many item issue, we would start on this dynamic view object initiative, which starts off with textures, right? Which that would be loading map levels as the scene loads. And so you wouldn't have to wait until a texture is at its full resolution. It would load the lowest resolution first and start moving up in resolution a lot like a game engine so that you don't have anything interrupting you. Subdivision levels, um, that's an example of how you know, things that you see in applications like ZBrush, you rotate around the viewport, it drops the, the subdivision level to maintain performance. And so view objects is going to allow us to, you know, automatically change things while you're working so that you have a consistent, a consistently good performance experience, especially with, as, as assets get more and more and more complex, which they have been over the past couple of years. Selection hit testing. Um, another very important aspect of Moto in general, when you select something, you're actually ray casting. And so selection hit testing can be improved dramatically and you should have less hangs and less pauses um, uh, when you're selecting things. Dynamic deformer caching, this is pretty cool, but it also, it's kind of turned into a very large story or a very large feature. We don't have deformer caching currently, we did in the past. And what you had to do is you had to play back the, um, the, anim the, the, the animation first and it would cache it. And then the next playbacks after it would be much, much, much faster because it was cached. Dynamic deformer caching will do this in the background while you're doing whatever else in Modo. And so when you go over to playback an animation, it'll already be cached. So scene saving, as far as saving, loading and startup is concerned, scene saving is the absolute most important in my opinion. Please tell me if you disagree. Um, but as an artist, I don't mind if scene loading takes a little while. Scene saving though is a big pain in the butt, um, particularly because of auto save and how important it is. So I really like for us to approach scene saving. And then we'll be on to our second phase of weight painting, continuing to improve that. And I guess just for a little bit more explanation, like weight painting, you know, there's weighting and there's weight painting, right? And weight painting involves brushes and there's a thing called a brush engine. And then there's also the editing of the vertex map. And so there's a lot of things going on there and a lot of different ways we can improve it. And we're, we're tackling it from multiple diff different angles. So UI, we will be beginning our work on the high DPI moto during 17.2. It will not be out during 17.2 though. And then moving on to OmniPy phase two that uh, we wanna add things like context sensitivity and easy customization in the UI. Rendering, we are add, adding Hydra. That should show up in 17.2, we're hoping it does. And integration of uh, our first third party renderer via Hydra. Now, just be forewarned, Hydra is just inherently limited uh, compared to what's possible in Modo natively. Um, but this is the path moving forward is having you know this generalized system for any renderer to hook up to any DCC app. And so we think it's very important um, to get moving on this and get it out the door for you folks. And tools, more tool performance optimization, more tool consolidation. And this is when we want to switch the viewport over to um, be the advanced viewport by default. Now, what exactly that means? We're working that out right now, um, but we really don't want users to have to rely on the default viewport. And we think we can tailor the advanced viewport to suit 
um, the needs of um, uh, the performance needs of even lower end systems. We've had some good results on this. We just need to organize it well and kind of come up with a better way for you guys to turn on and turn off AVP features um, uh, without, you know, without it getting, without it causing too many performance issues, right? Stability and bug fixes, frequent V releases every two to four weeks. That will never end. We need to keep on improving stability for you folks. Okay, so before we move on to the thank yous, um, do you need to just you know throw out a few other disclaimers that are not in text here? Um, I am so excited. I am so proud of what we've accomplished during 2023. This team, the Moto team, that includes engineers and QA, have done an amazing job with the work that they've done. Now, there's a lot more work to do. This is the foundation. Again, this is just the beginning. In 17 v one you will experience some really annoying hangs. You'll also experience some crashes. You know, that's just a consequence of the very deep changes that we've made. But we will continue to improve this with every single V release. Our goal throughout 2024 and beyond is that you see Moto just getting better and better and better via bug fixes and really valuable point releases, right? And so I just want to be straight with you guys as far as what your experience is going to be. You're going to enjoy 17.0. At least this is my experience. It feels so much better. You get frustrated with the hangs every now and then. And if you go back to 16.1, you're like, oh, I want to spend all my time in 17.0. Um, also, sculpting has some problems. Painting has some problems. Um, those are things that, you know, we're looking into how we want to solve those problems. Um, but yeah, not everything's perfect. But Gosh, as far as nailing a foundation, I think we got that exactly right. And uh, we're on a great path forward now. So thank yous, the alpha members, right? The people who submit bugs for us, man, um, all of these people were a big help. And I just want to thank to everybody who submits bugs. I mean, if you want to call an individual person out for being a bug submitter, Warren Lancashire, <laughs> like it's prolific. He's amazing. The guy submits so many bugs. And unfortunately, we don't always get to fix every bug that somebody, you know, submits. We have to prioritize things. And it's always in the interest of, you know, producing a better end result. And so that's one of the frustrating things about being an alpha tester. And it's one of my initial frustrations when I became a beta tester for Modo uh, around version 501, I think. Um, but I also want to call out Debbie Taylor. Debbie, we miss you. You know, um, really appreciate all the work that you do on Facebook and Man, I just, I, I hope we get to see you at SIGGRAPH or some other events in the future. You are an essential part of the Moto community and we all miss you and can't wait to see you again. Moto 17 content creators. These are the alpha testers who helped make content. Um, we got to call out Jan again. He did so much amazing work for us on this release and is, you know, a major part of the reason why we have such good content on this release. And all of these people contributed content and are all responsible for the great content we have. And so I cannot thank you enough for what you guys did. And I can't wait to uh, even do more collaborative things like we, we did during this past release. Like, you know, the, the animation that Jan did mentioned Frederick Widman helped out, Chemo Hellstrom uh, helped out. A lot of experts in, in Octane helped you know, get the, these renders out the door for Jan. So like pretty much everybody contributed. I played around with animating that, uh, that license plate animation and gave a little direction on, Hey, here's what I want this animation to say is that we're moving past the past and moving into the future. And so can't thank you guys enough for all the great content, all the great, you know, bug reports. And, you know, we couldn't do this without you folks. And finally, Thank you to Moto users. Um, you know, I'm going to kind of go on a, a quick aside here um, and tell you guys a little bit about myself. Um, a lot of you know me from the past. I've been at Foundry for 10 years now. I started out as a creative specialist demoing Moto. Creative specialist is a demo artist, you know, uh, who, sh who trains people on Moto and shows off the application. And um, uh, 
12 years ago, 13 years ago, there was a contest that was held on the Luxology forums at the time. A guy named Jim Burton held this contest. It was the Henning contest. And uh, Warner McGee, fantastic illustrator and great 3D artist these days, um, he did a, a sketch of this character, Henning, and we all had to make our 3D version of it. And I ended up winning that contest and, you know, uh, got to hop on a modcast with Brad, which was an um, epic moment for me. It was a big moment in my life. I, I still remember it vividly. Uh, and did some freelance work for Luxology after that. And then once uh, Moto came over to Foundry, I got hired as a creative specialist. And so the reason why I'm telling you this and that aspect of my history is I want to let you know I'm a Moto user. I use it almost every day. Um, you know, I'd say, you know, some weekends I, I don't use it. Um, but I've been using it probably almost every day for 15 years or more. Started with it in version 103. I love this application. I see so much potential for Modo. And my goal as a product manager is to, uh, well, I, you know, I, I want to see the Modo I want to see, of course, because, you know, uh, um, you know that, that, that's one of the nice things about being a product manager. But I feel like my goals are aligned with your goals as Modo users. I see the potential of Modo. And I want to realize that potential. You guys see the potential of Moto, and I want to realize that potential for you folks because your support is essential. Let's get started making the Moto that Moto users have always deserved. So have a great day. Can't wait to continue updating you on our progress throughout the 17 series. You're going to see more updates on that. Quick clips are going to be coming out. Uh, going into more detail on the individual enhancements. And from here, it's onward and upward, guys. Catch you later.